good evening everybody yes you are almost uh, completing this two days of your science week at university of agriculture sciences so this evening we have a panel discussion on science for society as a part of a panel discussion on science for society we have three eminent distinguished panelists namely dr anurag kurpath dr pravin kumar vemula and dr sangeeta menon all three of them are here i request all three of them to be on the dais i request them to be on the dais yes science means constantly walking a tight rope between blind faith and curiosity between expertise and creativity between bias and openness between experience and epiphany between ambition and passion and between arrogance and conviction in short between an old today and a new tomorrow yet quote by enrich rorer and to begin with our science for society panel discussion on behalf of all of you and on behalf of the university of agriculture sciences on on behalf of the postgraduate dean and directorate of postgraduate studies i welcome all three panelists today dr anurag krupath dr pavin kumar mevula and dr sangeeta menon once again floor to okay, kids there okay yes so to begin with so we need to hear uh, the panel discussion uh, part as a presentation from each one of them so later we have a group discussion on these aspects regarding their presentation part so there will be a sufficient time for the discussion regarding science for society in this aspect so to begin with so i need to request dr anurag kurpath for yeah and so now i have the pleasure in uh, um, reading out the contribution of dr anura gurpath here i request uh, to rise for a while and then you, you so that let, let my students to recognize you very well so professor anura gurpath is a professor of physiology and nutrition at st john's medical college bangalore and was the founding dean at st john's research institute bangalore he is presently the head of the first iaea international atomic energy agency collaborating center of nutrition located at st john's and is the past president of nutrition society of india and he is a fellow of the royal college of physicians at london at the national academy of medical sciences and the international union of nutrition sciences he is also margadarshi fellow of the welcome international union of nutrition sciences so and also the welcome trust dbt india alliance he has published more than 410 papers and is a co-author of Asian adaptation of Guyton's textbook of physiology he is also a co-editor of Asia Pacific adaptation and journal of clinical nutrition and associate editor of American journal of clinical nutrition while being on the editorial board of these journals he is a chairman of scientific advisory group of the nutrition division of indian council of medical research that is icmr and icmr expert committee on the rda of indians and nutrition and fortification scientific panel of ssai food safety and uh, standards also authority of india he is also a member of national technical board on nutrition niti ayog as well as several other national committees of the icmr dbt nabi as well as senior advisor tata trusts so his interests are plenty and a lot of his contributions are worth it and uh, i have no sufficient time to explain and we need to hear from him a lot and his interests
and he is very closely related to agriculture in the sense on the nutrition part or the nutrient part that means to say his interest in the agricultural nutrition connect with regards to human energy protein and micronutrients metabolism and public health nutrition in context of pregnancy childbirth anemia the body compaction composition and chronic diseases we have a very well known uh, medical professional related to agricultural part today as a part of panel discussion i welcome you once again from all behalf of on behalf of all of us sir so i request you to take part your uh, presentation in terms of panel discussion Thank you. we need to hear you uh, Thank you, thank you for being here and good evening. And of course, uh, for me it is uh, like coming home, I suppose, because I, I have I've had an association with uh, this distinguished university for a very long time. And uh, the, my first contact was Dr. Shesha, who's right here. And we've, we've been friends, that's the important thing. Beyond doing science together, we actually have been friends. Now. I, I came here to talk about, um, and I do want to thank the organizers to, for inviting me. Now, I, I came to talk about health and agriculture. You know, uh, for the last 10 years, there's been some debate about how you can't separate out agriculture and health. Up to then, if you go back in time, uh, there was a clear divide between those of us who did medicine and health and those of you who are doing food production and agriculture and somehow we never talked to each other. But of late now as we're beginning to see that the planet is having difficulties in supporting food production of any quality for a large number of people, 8 billion people, then you have to think uh, maybe we have to start linking up these things. So. These kind of connections between society and science uh, in medicine occurred in the framework of cellular uh, understandings going all the way up to society. But a new dimension that has come in today in science, and I want you to think very hard about that, is uh, the dimension of ethics. And you as in agriculture, I suspect, do not have to worry. There is no such field of plant ethics, is there? I'm not sure, but certainly GM foods uh, brings into mind this kind of thing about ethics. In medicine, ethics has been a big deal. Now, as we start linking these up, particularly with uh, GM crops and foods, particularly with fortified plants, biofortified plants, there's this concept coming in of equity in terms of people knowing what they're eating. And sometimes you don't know what you're eating. I'm sure all of you will say, well, I ate this food, but you will not know where it came from, and you will not know what was used, which was particularly like pesticides, for example. You will not know how much was there in that. And then you ask yourself, how much equity did I have when I ate my food? Answer is none. And when you think of poorer people who are on subsidy programs where they're given food, you really begin to wonder that between science and society lies this big block of ethics. And I will not discuss that today because I didn't come prepared to discuss ethics, but I did come prepared to think about the health and agricultural connect. For those of you who have thought about what you're doing, and I think in agriculture, when we were in medicine and I was a student, we had to deal with statistics. And as we dealt with statistics, we realized that almost all the statistical paradigms that we learned came from agriculture. Statistics in medicine came from examples in agriculture. Think about that. And now we use our own statistics, but we learned it from agricultural examples. And that's, for me, a great link between this kind of connection that we were always worried about plots of land on which different crops were grown and then you wanted to look at statistical differences between them. So I'm going to be talking to you about this uh, connection and uh, I, I want to just take you through protein. All of you are aware of the Green Revolution, aren't you? Now think about one thing, the Green Revolution. It was, it was all about growing a new variety, a dwarf variety of wheat and it was meant that India could feed its populations. It was a great thing 
at the time because it took India away from depending on what we call ship to mouth uh, politics, where ships would come in with grains of rice or wheat from America and we would feed our population. It was a wonderful thing. The important thing to know is that at the time it was the right thing to do. It has depleted the groundwater. There's no doubt about it. It is very heavily irrigation dependent. No doubt about it. Today, would you do another green revolution the way it was done at that time? Unlikely, because the cost to the environment is far too much. But at the time, it was a great, great thing to do. And the reason for that was because at the time, all we worried about was hunger. People were dying of hunger. You wanted to stop that. It did not matter. You had to get some food into them. And that was serious. And you could grow it. The important thing at the time was that proteins didn't matter. Just get people enough carbohydrates and energy. Let them get up and walk. The protein did not matter. But subsequently, there's been a great deal of work that was done um, by uh, my group at St. John's, and this was done from early 1990s to about 2006. And it was a series of papers that we actually produced. And the other group that was doing similar work was at MIT in the United States. And it was two groups that produced these papers that eventually uh, forced the WHO to come out with a new book called The Protein and Amino Acid Requirements in Human Nutrition. And there was a very important thing in that. It came out in 2007. It's taken almost, it's taken more than a decade, but it is beginning to impact the way agricultural policy works. Human nutrition linked to agricultural policy. How is that? Well, the important thing for the amino acid requirements was that earlier in 1985, if you can see, don't worry about the figures, but you can see they're quite low in the tens or sometimes below 10. After we did all our research and published that series of papers, we actually figured out that the amino acid requirements were much higher, twice as high, some places three times as high. Now that was a huge difference. Suddenly it became very clear that you had to eat proteins that delivered these amino acids in this amount. Up to then, it was so low, you could eat any protein. You could eat, in other words, you could live at that time, the thinking was, you could live by eating plain, plain rice for all three meals, nothing added. Do you know of any society in this world that eats plain rice or plain wheat? No. They always add something. They will add, in many societies, they add fish. Some societies, they add dal, like in India, some places milk but there's always a complementing of these cereals. There's a wisdom in culture, and that wisdom said, there's something wrong with those old requirements. The new ones came out. Now, what did this mean? What it meant was that earlier, if you took all these, can you see these food groups here? From cereals to ragi millets, to vegetables, nuts and seeds, to dals, to animal protein, which could be milk, eggs, meat, you name it. In the earlier WHO, FAO uh, statements, it was all these proteins were good enough for you to eat. You did not need to worry about protein. Suddenly after the WHO came out in 2007, it became clear that if you wanted to feed people the right protein, there were only two groups that met that, food groups. Legumes or pulses or animal protein. All the rest were not great. They were less than 100 100 is the, is the minimum quality. Now, there is no doubt that if you can take rice, it's a poor quality protein, and eat a bucket of it for every meal. Eat tons of rice. Because you eat so much rice, that inefficiency in the protein will be overcome because you're eating so much. So you meet your protein requirements now. Do you know what the problem with that is? You eat too much rice, you're going to become fat because there's too much energy. You might meet your requirements, but you're not eating enough. Uh, you're eating too much energy. So this was the problem. Here it is, a bucket of rice. And really, that's the problem, that you should not be eating like that. 
you really want to add certain high quality foods into your diet, particularly dal or if you're non-vegetarian, meat or if you think milk is not an animal food and it's okay for vegetarians, good for you, drink milk, okay? But this is the sort of thing that you need to do. And this is the problem that if you look at it in the government structures in India, the bureaucracy is, is stuck on one theme. And that is that if you want to feed poor people, you can see the way they, these are pictures of feedings. Can you see there's just buckets of rice that are given and there'll be just some small kind of rasam or something that's given just to you know make it swallowable. But at the end of it, cereals is it. You go to your PDS, you know the public distribution system? It's the one thing people are getting is lots of cereals. You go into your ICDS, you go into the midday meal, it's all about cereals. And the, the thing that I hear from bureaucrats often is, at least the Hindi ones in Delhi, they'll say, iska pet bharne ka hai. Just fill the damn stomach. Well, it doesn't matter what you filled it with, just get it full. You could put a balloon inside and just inflate it if you wanted, but that's not a good thing. I think the, the, the kind of thinking of, like I said, the science to coming to society, and remember, India is very much a society that gives. It's a society that looks after, or is supposed to look after poor people. There's a PDS, there's an ICDS, an MD, and there are meals for pregnant women. We look after people in theory. In practice, it's very different. But look, the, there is the forefathers who thought about these things. But the problem is, we didn't think about what to feed. And there's another problem with protein. That is that you think you're eating protein. You say you're drinking milk or you're taking a cup of dal. You think you're digesting it all. We don't know. We're not sure you're digesting your food. So in fact, the WHO asked the FAO to look into this. The FAO is more an agricultural organization. And the FAO came out with this evaluation of protein quality uh, early this century. And at the end of that, the, there was the serious problems. People are thinking, how are we going to do this? So there was a meeting then that the FAO co convened at St. John's where we actually started thinking about how to measure protein quality and came out with yet another FAO book which gave us the methods to do it. And what's the problem? The problem is this. If you want to measure digestibility, you just say how much went in, how much came out, take the difference, you know how much went in, zero should come out. That means it got digested fully. If it didn't get digested, everything came out. The problem is that there are bacteria, just like the rumen in a cow, there are also bacteria in the colon, and that messes up all these things because digestion occurs in the small intestine. So what you really want is to get somebody, knock off their colon, it's called a colostomy or a colectomy, if you like, and then you've got this person left behind with just a small intestine and a hole coming out, and you collect that, and then you know what went in, what came out, and that's good. Sounds right? Not ethical. Not something we want to do. But what we did was we did look for patients who do have... Sometimes, you know, when people have cancer, or they've had an accident, or sometimes in rural areas you get what's called a bull gore injury, where, you know, the horn of the bull goes into the, into the abdomen. And such patients' intestines get ripped up. And what one does then is till the intestine heals, you make a small hole. Can you see that? So you disconnect so that you're giving the rest to the colon, for example, the large intestine. There you can put a bag and collect everything. Sounds good? Not so good. Not for anyone because it's a mess and these, these are not healthy patients. They're sick. And, you know, you go to a sick patient and say, can I collect everything that comes out of you? They're not going to be that happy. You have to be careful. So what we did was we decided on, well, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but we decided to use isotopic methods, which allow you to be non-invasive, but yet allow you to actually give a test protein that's labeled with deuterium or 13 carbon. And if you actually just feed these tests, these proteins into people, you can figure out digestibility. It's magic. 
Next problem. Where are you going to get labeled proteins from? Do you know this handsome guy? I'm sure you all know him. Well, that's the thing. Seisha and I have had a long collaborative history, a very long collaborative. It must be three decades, I suppose. But it's a great kinship we've had, friendship. We never fought with each other, ever. And we, were, we, were, we really felt that stable isotopic. Have you fought with a lot of people here, Seisha? <laughs> oh, he's wonderful. I, for me, Seisha has been an absolutely great intellectual friend. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that, so we went to Seisha and we asked him that, look, we need to produce labeled proteins. Can you, for example, grow us some dal pulses and just can you water it with heavy water instead of regular water? Just water it with heavy water, that deuterium will get into the proteins and you've got intrinsically labeled pulse protein. And of course, the great thing about Seisha is he never ever will say no and he never ever looks at what's difficult. He just says, yes, let's do it. I'm sure some of you do research with him and you will know that that enthusiasm and optimism is what defines him. And we got another guy. I don't know if you know him from here. Where is he? He's sitting right here. Rajshekar Reddy. He is also a former student from here, now a postdoc working with me at St. John's. But Reddy, both of them look very serious here. I can't believe I got the most serious looking pictures. They're actually fun-loving people. But sorry about that. This is all the pictures I could get. But Reddy and Seisha, Seisha mainly, Reddy helped us with this, but they grew for us chickpeas, mung bean, rice, uh, ragi. What else did you grow for us? There are four things, right? And what I want to do is to grow even more things with him. It's such a simple method because what they do is they have this rain out shelter. I'm sure you've all seen this on your campus. And these are the pots. And in those pots, either Reddy Garu or somebody else would go. There was another lady, I've forgotten her name, uh, who used to work with us. But uh, it's just wonderful people. And they, they very carefully checked this. And we even had, we lost a crop because of, uh, of uh, what do you call it? A mold, a fungus. And it broke my heart, broke everyone's heart. We were all suicidal at losing that crop. <laughs> but uh, we came through it and grew it again. But this is a crop and we'd, we'd, we'd label it and eventually we would feed it to children, we'd feed it to others, take samples, look at the breaths, isotopic ratios, and we were able to figure out how much of the crop that we grew when cooked and eaten got digested. Nice, no removing the intestine, no putting tubes in, nothing. It was just nice, simple stuff. Eat, okay, I'll, I need some blood, but that was it. It was a nice experiment. And eventually that got covered by the Hindu uh, where we, they described it as a novel method to measure protein digestion. And that's another girl there called Sarita who has been instrumental in helping me run mass spectrometry uh, for this method. But this was published and it was seen as a new method. Well, we asked several questions at that point. Okay, Seisha is doing the dals and everything for us. What about animal proteins? People eat eggs meat, milk, fish. In some parts of the country, they eat crabs, snails, anything, anything that moves. So how do we do this? And, and how do we get measurements in children? Two more people, one of them is right here from agricultural sciences again. So I've had a long history of working with people from this college and this university. That's Sindhu Kashyap sitting right here. And she was, she used to teach you guys, but unfortunately she taught the batch that has just graduated, not, these are too fresh. But uh, she used to teach uh, biochemistry, right Sindhu? Some, okay, well, she's a bit shy over there. And we had another, another wonderful person called Nirupama Shivkumar, who's a pediatrician. And she got very interested in these things. So between the two of them, they came to me and said, you know, we need to get animal protein. And you know what they did? They went, can you see this picture? It's of a chicken. 
these are chickens. They actually got laying chickens from a farm, brought them into our animal house where our ethics committee was furious. They said, what is a chicken? It's not an animal for us. We are happy to give you ethical approval to study rats and mice and hamsters and rabbits. But what is a chicken? And well, we had to just say a chicken is a feathered rabbit. It's about that size. <laughs> That's okay. And somehow that was convincing for them because they allowed us to keep chickens. We fed them very well. And you can see here the chicken with its open beak. Sindhu was there. And she literally trained them such that they wouldn't fight. For them, it was a good thing. Come in in the morning and feed them with labeled amino acids such that they were laying labeled eggs. And so we got labeled animal protein. And at the end of it, the ethics committee, actually, when we asked them, we want to retire these chickens. We want to send them away to a free-range retirement paradise where they can live out their lives happily. And the ethics committee actually told us, no, you won't. You will sacrifice them. And I was upset because we actually were ready to take those chickens back to that poultry farm, but for, to live out in the open, not in a cage. You know, they had helped us. And they made us sacrifice them. If you're going to sacrifice a chicken, what, do you, what would you do? You could eat them, right? Because their meat was labeled. So they were not only laying us labeled eggs, but they were actually labeled chickens. So we could get labeled chicken meat. And we did all these experiments. And then Sindhu again got very excited about wanting to do milk. So what she did was she found, can you see this picture there? It's a, it's a beetle goat. And she found this lactating beetle goat, which we then asked Sesha to grow us cowpea and maize as feed for that goat. And that was harvested, kept at UAS. Then we had to get ethical approval from the National Institute of Animal Physiology. I could not convince our ethics committee that a goat was nothing but a large rabbit. That, so we could not keep it in our animal house. And the only place to keep goats in ethical conditions is the National Institute of Animal Physiology. But then they refused to take it unless we proved it didn't have brucella. So we had to get it checked for brucella at the Institute of Animal Health and Veterinary Biologicals, which is down the road. So a lot of stuff. And then when we milked it after eating this, we got labeled milk, which we rushed to CFTRI in Mysore, where it was spray dried for us. So then we could keep it. And from CFTRI, this is what we have. And right now we are measuring how, what happens when you give this milk to a variety of people. So you can see it takes a lot of production. But this kind of research, I think, has not been done anywhere else. It requires a lot of good people to work together, starting with Sesha. And I think it's been a wonderful agree, uh, collaboration with, with, with this universe, university. At the end of it, here's the, the, me the message I want to give you. Just, these are digestibilities, all right? Chickpea, ming, mung bean, mung bean without the skin, spirulina protein, egg white, whole egg, meat, milk. And you'll see that if you take the average digestibility, Anything that is animal, can you see that? Is about 90% digested. Anything that's plant is about 60% digested. That's bad news. That tells you that if you're going to eat dal, and you think you're eating so much of dal and you've got so much of milk, means the same thing, it doesn't. Okay, the dal is 60%, this is 90%. So then you have to eat more dal if you want. That's what the message is. And we published this as a series, and actually there's an ongoing series of papers now that we have to do it as a series. You must understand this when you want science to influence policy and therefore society. It never happens with a single paper, not unless you're Einstein. It takes a series. It takes grinding work. And eventually we are slowly publishing and publishing this. And what's lucky for us is that the Hindu seems to like what we're doing. And so that reporter there keeps asking me, what else have you got? And we keep telling him, and he keeps writing about it, which is a good thing, because eventually, if I'm going to talk anywhere in the government, is it at Niti Ayo or anywhere else, you really need evidence, and this is the evidence one needs. Now, everyone says India has malnourished children. Do you know how you judge malnutrition? If you're short, right? Or if you're skinny. 
Now, they say that 30% of Indians, in fact, 40% of Indian kids are too short. All right? Now, if I look at all of you here, I might find about maybe 25% of you are short. Do you agree? Yes? Good for you. Now, here's the thing. Now, what we are trying to do in India is to feed these kids. And when you want to feed kids, what do you do? The government sees a very good way to feed kids is the ICDS program. Have you heard of the ICDS? The Integrated Child Development Scheme. They are these what are called Anganwadis, where you can put children. There you feed them. A lot of stuff going on. But I want to show you one thing. Now, look at this graph. On this axis is something called a Z score. Don't worry about it. All it means is that normally, normally, if a child is growing, and on the y-axis is age, on the x-axis is age, as a child grows, if it is growing normally, its Z score will be zero. Have you got that? If a child falls below, it is getting undernourished. Clear? The important thing I want to show you here, you can't see it, is that this is when it is born. Here, can you see this line? This is when it's two years old, and that's when it's five years old. Have you got that? What strikes you from this? When does undernutrition occur? Before two years, do you agree with that? They've all gone. After two years, it's pretty flat. Okay, that's the red line. That is height. The blue line is weight. Both height and weight go down. If you look at the rules of an Anganwadi, do you know at what age you can admit your child? Three years. Okay, are you seeing the disconnect now? The child's already undernourished by the time you, in, you think. And you take a stunted child and try and feed it. Believe me, you're going to get puzzled. Because some children go this way, some grow this way. You can never predict. So you could get fat children. And then they're going to have a heart attack when they're 40 years old and blame you for all the feeding you did. You've got to be careful. So this is the problem. And here's where society has to think hard about how we deal with this because at below two years, that child is in the care of its mother at home. That child is getting a ration to take home. That ration is not fit for animals to eat. And that's the problem. And eventually, look at that. This is all over, this is all India data. I've done it by state. Every state is like this. We are losing our kids in the first two years and all our feeding programs are after three years. What the hell is wrong with us? Okay, but we're trying to change this. Okay. And here's another thing. I'm not only interested in stable isotopes. By the way, all these isotopes I'm using are stable, all right? They do not kill you. Be aware of that. But I do look at radioisotopes, which are the ones that emit harmful gamma rays. And you can actually look at, uh, you know, all of you as you're sitting here, do you realize you're, you're irradiating each other? Are you a source of gamma rays? Yes or no? Yes, you are. Do you know which element is giving off those gamma rays? Potassium. All right? Potassium has a radioactive isotope that's in you. So you're radiating him and he's radiating you back. And in time, when these radiations happen, spontaneous mutations occur. That's why mutations in DNA occur. There's radiation in your body. What's nice is, have any of you heard of what a gamma counter is? Have you heard of gamma counting? Have they worked with radioactive isotopes at all, Sesha? Well, okay, but there's something called a gamma counter where you can actually count the radiation coming off a body. So this is what we do. We put pregnant women who have natural radiation, put them in this counter system, which is a gamma counter, and we had a fantastic young man from NIAS, whose name was Kishore Bhatt, and I'm glad there's a Nias Dean over here, and she knows him well, but there's some very fancy Monte Carlo modeling that you have to do for the geometry of the human body, which he did for us. And we're able to get readings of radiation. That tells us how much potassium there's in the body. Potassium is linked to protein in a, in a, in a complex way, but eventually you can figure out how much protein's in the body. So as a pregnant woman goes through pregnancy, the protein content is gonna increase. So you can figure it out. You can measure it without doing anything, just by measuring that gamma rays. And here's the thing. If you ask any pregnant woman and you ask anyone in government, ask any of you, 
How do you feed a pregnant woman? Do you know what you're going to say to me? You're going to say that. Just eat for two. Eat a little more. Is that a good thing to say? Nope. Not a good thing. They actually need much more protein in what they eat. Right now, the government is feeding them through the ICDS system and pretty much not giving them, they're giving them too much food. And a pregnant woman can't eat that much. And as a result, she eats half of it or quarter of it, and the protein that she eats goes down. So we're trying to get the government to put more protein, like an egg or milk, into the diets of pregnant women so that they can eat a bit more. It's expensive, but the Karnataka government is very keen to do it. At least they, and we're hoping that we can get this. It's very hard, by the way. It's easy to transport dal, easy to transport grains. All of you in agriculture, lucky. You get into the other part of it, try and transport milk. Transporting fluid is very, very difficult and expensive. So as a result, we have tried to make milk powder. Or try and transport an egg. You buy a dozen eggs and take it home, and you'll find you crack some of them. So imagine doing this at a large scale. So we're trying to figure out those problems. So do we produce enough of these things? Well, here's India's picture of, now I'm coming to agriculture and I'm going to ask you some questions. That's the production in million tons in India. There's one crop for which India is almost the world leader, second in the world. But can you see the way from the 1950s to the present, that crop has just gone up and up and up. Can anyone tell me what that crop was? Tell me. I think you got it. Did you say sugarcane? No, you didn't. Oh, damn, I shouldn't have told you. All right, so it is sugarcane. That's the crop that India produces large amounts of. It's the second only to Brazil in the world. And Karnataka is not that bad, but Maharashtra and UP are the big, big producers. And you know that people are actually very unhappy because sugarcane farmers don't do very well. This is the crop for, this line is for cereals. Can you see a red line at the bottom that's like it's dead? That's pulses, right? Don't produce enough of it at all. And the reason this has happened is because sugarcane has done really well because it has great yield. There are farmers in Erode, in Tamil Nadu, who claim to get 100 tons per hectare. Can't believe it, but that's what they get. There are also cooperatives. So when farmers come together, and grow things and control things, things do well, cooperatives. And of course, politics. And if you go to Maharashtra and UP, all the MLAs are basically sugar barons. So they protect it. If you look at, for example, the cereals going up, it was because of irrigation, fertilizers, and very good extension work. Extension is a great word in agriculture. It's not that great in nutrition and health, but I think that was why it did so well. And if you look at milk, milk has gone up. Again, it's cooperatives. It looks like cooperatives work because politicians become rich on them. And then eventually they keep it going. And I think the problem for pulses is nobody cares about pulses. And as a result, um, the, the per capita availability in 1950, people were eating about 75 grams of pulses per day. It has dropped to almost 30 grams now. That is terrible. While everything else has stayed the same, cereals, you look at vegetables, milk has gone up, everything is going up. Eggs are going to be the big deal in the future. But look at pulses, it's dying. There's a big problem. And we've actually modeled this. I hope there was an, we're going to hope there was an economics person over here. Ah, now there's some econometrists over here. Well, essentially what we did was to model whether India would be able to meet its requirement for quality foods. And it's very clear, India right now is, has got a problem of production of pulses. It's somewhere around 10 to 12 metric million tons per year of pulses. It's going up very slowly, but India imports another four or five million tons of pulses from outside. But look at the demand. And as we put it, if India only were to produce pulses to meet the requirement of protein, it would need about 45 to 50 million tons per year. There's no way that's going to happen. No way. 
because we don't care about pulses. And uh, the problem is, as farmers take up growing pulses, the government does not support them in terms of price regulation. Prices crash, and then farmers give up on pulses. That's the problem. So we need to figure. So the way to do it is to look whether we can actually add milk. And if you have milk and pulses, you'll find that still our demand in 2026 will still not be met by both the production of milk or by pulses. It looks like India is going to have trouble meeting its protein requirements over the next five to seven years. I don't know how we'll solve this. Anyway, giving you all sorts of bad news, right? Let me give you a nice, heartwarming story. This is a story of an intervention, a magic intervention that was done on children. Do you remember I told you about the Z score in that previous one? Here are children, they were tiny, they were minus three, they should have been up here. They were here. They were given a two-year intervention. And look, they grew and grew and grew and grew and grew till they almost reached normal. Magic. We try to make kids grow, never grow like this. Can anyone guess what that magic, magic intervention was? Yes? Shout it out. Shout it out. Many people have said, well, it's vaccines, or they were given antibiotics. Anything else? Do you think they were fed anything? How do you make children grow so well? Milk, possible. Anything else? But you know, people have tried all this. With milk and with other things, you'll find that they grow, but they'll probably flatten out somewhere here. They don't grow so spectacularly. In two years, a minus three goes to minus one, which is almost normal. Wow. Okay, I won't put you, put you out of your agony, and this is my last slide. It was adoption. These kids were minus three and adopted to go to Sweden. They went to Sweden, and in Sweden, you get a clean environment, diverse food, lots of love and attention. So what I'm trying to tell you is that in policy, and this comes to science to society again, Many of us, and I think this comes from a post-Gatesian world, where Bill Gates is probably the biggest villain in this piece, where, you know, it is like you can find that magic bullet. You get that, you patent it, you produce it, you become a billionaire, you buy your plane. Well, I don't think it works like that. To me, it's systemic. You have to change many things. You can't take good quality milk and pulses and put it in a hut. In a, in a village without considering that there's no toilet, there's no running water, there's no other things. Society has to get better. So I always say this, that science and society, we are seduced by the idea that we can do something as a magic bullet. I say science and society is incremental. It's a lot of hard work, but that's the only way we will get this kind of thing. And this is published it's in a journal called the Uppsala Journal of Medical Sciences. Very well done study. I've never seen an intervention that worked so well. But please, for all of you, I know you want that. You want that one crop that will change the world. One solution that will change the world. I'm not so sure. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, Dr. Anura Krupat, for your very good uh, talk on the subject, specifically health, nutrition, agriculture connect in India, covering most part of the agriculture-related aspects and uh, human health, nutrition part, and present scenario by giving special emphasis on protein nutrition, especially for all. So it is good to say adoption. So let, with the clean environment, and the good love and affection any can, anyone can sustain very well. And there is agriculture in it. Thank you very much for a nice talk on this aspect. So I wish uh, all of you can give a very big, big applause for his nice talk in this aspect. Now let us move on to the second panelist uh, for today's uh, talk, uh, especially on science and science for society. 
Now here is Professor Sangeeta Menon, so whom I need to introduce before you. It is my pleasure to introduce her. She is Professor and Head Consciousness Studies Program, National Institute of Ad Advanced Studies at IISC Bangalore. Uh, Professor Sangeeta Menon is a philosopher, psychologist. Her education background is in biology, philosophy, and psychology. She is a professor at the uh, NIAS in the campus of IASC and joined NIAS in 1996 with particular interest on consciousness studies. She heads the consciousness studies programs at uh, NIAS. And Dr. Menon has been working in the area of consciousness studies for over 20 years. So a lot of credits in her things with uh, regard to the consciousness. She has given numerous lectures and presentations relating to consciousness, mind and science and spirituality interface issues. Her publications cover large areas that con concerns consciousness studies, brain sciences, altruism, aesthetics, Indian psychology, and science spiritu spirituality and art dialogues. She has several publications in peer-reviewed journals and has contributed chapters on a variety of issues relating to science and religion, self, mind and consciousness especially our chapter on Hinduism and science that appeared in the Oxford Handbook of Religion and Science gives a fresh outlook on this issue. She has also authored few monographs on consciousness and in the context of Indian uh, thought. Uh, our latest publication especially appeared in Springer, that is Brain, Self and Consciousness, Explaining the cons Conspiracy of Experience and the edited volume in Interdisciplinary Perspectives on Consciousness and the Self. With her colleagues, she organized several international and national conferences. Just to name a few, Scientific and Philosophical Studies in Consciousness during 1998, which was the first consciousness in India on this subject, bringing together scientists, philosophers, and so on, to who seeks awareness on the fundamental questions on consciousness and human identity. The other major conferences on science and metaphysics Consciousness and Genetics, Science and Beyond, Consciousness and uh, Experience in Ways, Knowing, and most likely, especially the one inter very interesting aspect is on consciousness, cognition, and culture, so which implication in the 21st century. So in addition to that, she is uh, a national task force member, especially on the Cognit Cognitive Science Research Institute, which was uh, mainly put, by, put up by DBT as a DST, the Government of India. She was nominated for Council Member of the Indian Council of Philosophical Research. Presently, she is a board member of the International Association of Transpersonal Psychology and the Asia Conscious Society. She was awarded the National Award of Young Philosopher Award from Indian Council of Philosophical Research for her research work in 2003. She has visited many number of countries to deliver invited talks and as a visiting professor at Oxford Center of Hindu Studies and also in the Nanzan Institute of Religion and Culture, Nanzan University, Japan. So now I request uh, Madam Sang Professor Sangeeta Menon to be on the dais and on behalf of all of you and on behalf of the uh, Directorate of Postgraduate Studies, I request our beloved Dean to welcome her with, by providing a bouquet. Thank you, ma'am. So I request uh, to deliver your panel discussion subject. Good evening. And uh, thank you so much for that very elaborate uh, introduction. And I was wondering who is being introduced. Sometimes it happens. And I wish to also thank my dear friend, Professor Satyanarayana, because of whom I am here. And thanks very much for your kind invitation, sir. It's always a pleasure to be here and close to earth. And thank you all colleagues uh, whom we met before the panel discussion started. Uh, well, I took the topic, Science for Society, quite seriously before coming for the panel discussion. Uh, but any topic which you take seriously, actually you end up with more questions than answers. 
because the complexity of the subject is too large that any attempt to solve it, perhaps using one parameter or just a few parameters, perhaps would be inadequate. And I think that's something which you were also trying to say. I also thought it's interesting that uh, the panel topic is not science and society, but it is science for society. And I thought perhaps that was very uh, purposeful by whoever conceived that topic, because often you hear these as two binaries, science and society, which you have to address perhaps equally as divergent. Here, when we say for society, there's, always, uh, there's also a kind of a goal orientation which is brought in there, that uh, the whole outcome or the final uh, product of science has to be for the society in some way or the other, which means it contributes to the well-being of the society and uh, the progress of the society and so on. But uh, keeping these two keywords in our mind, such as science and society, and that middle unit as very important, which is for, how do we consider uh, this whole equation between science and society? And I think we are all budding scientists, scholars um, here, working on various problems. But uh, uh, you may also perhaps considering that you are all scientists and you have to work for society, right? Because we work in a university, so we, our identity is mostly in terms of the profession than also being part of a society. So that I think is also very interesting, that how do we consider ourselves? Do you consider yourself primarily as a scholar or a researcher, or do you consider yourself as the part and parcel of the society which you live? And I think the second part is extremely important. Most of the challenges which we see in the society today is because the second part is not considered seriously. And our identity is more towards the profession and our arguments are therefore also in lieu of that profession. But I would think that primarily and foremost, we belong to the society and then to a practice and a profession called science. Because without society, there is no science. And uh, the whole idea of science is to, is to work for the society. So keep, keeping that introduction in mind, how do we approach the correlations between science and society or so societal change? How do you bring social change? This is something we, we all hear, right, that we are all um, agents of social change. How do we bring in social change? It's very easy to talk about it. It's very easy perhaps even to philosophize, philosophize about it, do even a scholarly work, but it is something which very central to ground action. It all depends upon finally what do we do with it. But uh, even that action in, in the ground level is based on certain uh, fundamental ideas. One I think is knowledge. It is knowledge which connects the practice of science and being a social entity, being a part and parcel of the society. We all create knowledge, we are also partakers of knowledge, we also continuously try to improvise and contribute to the whole gamut of knowledge. So what is knowledge? This is a very philosophical question that what do we mean by knowledge? Well, maybe if I ask that question to you, all of you would say, oh, it's very clear what is knowledge. And then you would define that in terms of perhaps certain answers, certain responses, or certain results which you get in your lab, or a cumulative understanding which perhaps you will get as a result of your experience, which is combined with your scholarship. And the last part is going to be very important, particularly in today's world, because knowledge is not detached from that cumulative experience of a life term. And uh, so our life and way of living is definitely going to contribute to the connector of knowledge between science and society, not just as a knowledge producer, but as people responsible for creating knowledge and also perhaps uh, understanding how knowledge which we create is going to influence the society and the, how the society is going to look at it. 
Now, there is a lack of time, so I have to limit perhaps within uh, five, ten minutes or so. So, I wouldn't go into the details. But I think the whole production of knowledge, because as you would know that today we live in a consumer society which is known for knowledge production. Everything is production. So, knowledge is also production. And there were earlier times where people talked about knowledge for liberation. Whether in the West or the East, knowledge is something which liberates you, which makes you free. But today what happens? More and more knowledge, you feel more and more competitive, you feel more and more bound, right? With more knowledge, you, there's more competitiveness because never there is a limit to what you need to be knowing. And we all know this, right? I mean, the kind of percentage you need to get into uh, a very good institution shows that the whole idea of knowledge perhaps has lost its nature. So can we look at knowledge away from knowledge production to perhaps knowledge transformation? How does knowledge transform you? How does knowledge help you to understand your fellow being? Because finally we are talking about not just oneself, not just yourself. You're going to be not going to be, are already a part and parcel of a large phenomenon called as a society or social living where everything matters to everybody. In such a connected world, uh, it, ha it cannot be on just on the scale of production, but it has to be also on the possibility of transformation. So the whole idea of knowledge, I think, is extremely important when we talk about social change and what does science do in order to bring, uh, uh, bring forward social change. The second connector, which I thought I should uh, share with you, is interdisciplinarity. There was a time when you, know, you just excel in one discipline and you get a good job or you are qualified as a very excellent person in that. But today, the questions which we ask borders at least two disciplines. And if it doesn't bother to discipline, then your question is inadequate. Your question is not grounded in the real world which we are living today. There's no question which can be just answered by just one book discipline or one discipline which is covered by a particular syllabus. So interdisciplinarity is so rampant today that unless we open our mind, unless we have a perspective which covers open-ended questions, which uh, covers different perspectives, we cannot really understand the problems that face us. And the whole practice of interdisciplinarity today has gained a lot of attention. And uh, I know that in your own field, it's very important. And the field from where I come, cognitive sciences, for example, is one uh, discipline which has gained so much uh, attention because of the interdisciplinary inputs in it needs. And the other one is artificial intelligence, again, which you would know that where the question is not just about computing, but it's also about who owns the identity. When you have reached a certain computing power and you reach a particular um, stage where your whole makeup is different, you start talking about identity. So who owns the identity? Is uh, an artificial system, a robotic system would have an identity to question you back? This is one question which I think uh, people are very uh, alarmed about. Of course, we have seen a lot of science fiction movies, right? I mean, a whole lot of science fiction movies which very beautifully uh, brings these questions. Uh, and if you have not, maybe some of the movies you should see is OS, uh, which is uh, the operating system, and uh, Transcendence and uh, The Bicentennial Man, which is the classic Robin, William movie, Robin Williams movie, which uh, combines human emotions into what you call as artificial intelligence, and how human emotions take over in even understanding what is called as intelligence. So the whole question of intelligence itself is to be analyzed, understood in a very large framework because today we live in a world of interdisciplinary engagement and not just disciplinary engagement. But mind you, that doesn't mean that you need not be good in your discipline. Many people consider interdisciplinarity as not being good in your own discipline, but maybe knowing a little bit of everything. That's not interdisciplinarity. Interdisciplinarity is the ability to ask questions 
from a much frame, larger framework, keeping in mind the strength of your own core discipline from where you come. So as students, as teachers, uh, as scholars, and uh, as also part of this society, I think we have come to a stage where our questions have to be much more engaged, much more open, and much more disciplinary free, which means we cannot just uh, shut ourselves in the closet of a particular discipline and say this is what is truth, because your truth is actually a, a falsity in terms of uh, another discipline. So that, that is why interdisciplinarity becomes very important and it also makes us very humble. As uh, practitioners of knowledge, as uh, scholars and students, the, the, the moment you bring in the scope of interdisciplinarity, it, becomes us, it makes us humble because questions are never answered completely. It only is answered to be asked by another discipline. The third, since uh, we are running short of time, the third connector between science and society I thought we should share um, is it's a magical wo a word, but it is also perhaps a much abused word, particularly in today's um, uh, contemporary uh, scenario, which is ethics. Uh, the moment we talk about ethics, you confuse it with morality. And you say how you need to live, with whom you should, to, should be walking, and so on. But no, ethics is not just morality. Ethics has a long tradition in philosophy, in psychology, and what is called as phenomenology. Ethics is basically to understand what action of yours would bring in goodness to yourself and to your neighbor. That is the fundamental pursuit of ethics. Ethics is not a debilitating or a stopping enterprise. Today we consider ethics as a very stopping, controlling, manipulating exercise. So we talk, if we talk to people, say, you be ethical, you are not ethical. And it's a very, very manipulative and a very kind of a very forceful manipulation, which actually people can do on everybody else. But mind you, ethics is not just morality. Ethics is something, a, gr a larger enterprise, again, which uh, connects science and society, which asks larger questions but at the same time, it brings in a huge sense of responsibility. And responsibility comes when our perspective is larger, not shorter. That is the meaning of responsibility. When do we become responsible? We become responsible when we know the implications of our action, when we have consequential thinking, right? That is when we become responsible. Responsible to whom? Not just responsible to oneself but also responsible to a group of people, to a community of people, perhaps who is related to you. So you would see that today, it is very much important that we also talk about questions that borders ethics and disciplinary practice. And as we all know that ICMR itself has a slew of uh, ethics committee, which has to, as Doctor was saying, has to you know, finally grant you your projects. Well, that is extremely important, but uh, as the ICMR guideline also, I think, uh, considers, it's very important to look into the intervention or the forceful intervention which we do into the human life, if it is human ethics. Of course, animal ethics, it's a different um, scenario. So how much is our intervention into the life of another person? is providing good for that person and to the community around you. So finally, what I wanted to bring to your attention and my own attention is that as uh, people who work in the area of knowledge, people who are part of a society who lives and uh, borrows every day, we are borrowing every day from our environment and every day from the people around us. So we have huge debt. We are huge debt. How to give back this debt? How to pay back our debt? The only way is to, by thinking, how is that knowledge which we are creating is going to contribute to goodness for the community around us and for to oneself. And goodness, again, it is not on the hedonistic sense of the uh, word, but goodness today is pretty much agreed to be well-being. And well-being is different from health. Well-being converges in your physical, mental, 
and also health which covers a whole large factors which is perhaps beyond your mind and body. So can we engage in a conversation which works about scientific research, works on scientific research, borders on scientific research, and also takes a lot from the society and also being a social change agent. Can we keep that in mind and uh, look at the whole nature of well-being? How do we produce well-being? How do we be part of well-being? Which the, I would think is the only parameter which is going to be very important in the years to come. Because who is going to do good for another person is going to determine the first person's goodness. Because my goodness is, my being good is very much going to be dependent on my neighbor's goodness. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Sangeeta Menon, for your nice panel discussion talk on science and for putting the words other, either and or for society. So very knowledge, technology, production, liberation, border between the sciences or without the borders or inter interdisciplinary approaches. Why not students ask questions to have some of these aspects. So thank you very much for giving a very good panel discussion talk on behalf of all of you and on behalf of the university. I wholeheartedly thank for this talk. Now we have the last panel discussion speech, mainly by another important uh, speaker. Uh -huh. Who is uh, Dr. Praveen Kumar Vemula. So he is actually uh, the self-assembled biomaterial and uh, translational uh, research in STEM at NCBS Bangalore, who is very close to our campus. He is a faculty at uh, Institute of STEM Cell Biology and Regenerative Medicine, Bangalore. His work spans the field of biomaterials, drug delivery, medical devices, and chemical biology. He has published more than 65 peer-reviewed papers and he has given more than 100 national and international invited lectures and has more than 20 issued pending and national and international patents. So several technologies have developed in his lab. He have formed foundation for multiple products on the market and currently under development. So at this stage, my dear student friends, I need to acknowledge for his very well-worthy contributions his technologies have led to the launch of four companies, including Sepio Health, an anti-pesticide technology company in India, Iris uh, Therapeutics, a drug delivery company for IBDs in USA, a skin, defic, uh, a skin care company in France, and Alivio Therapeutics, an inflammation targeting company in USA. So most of his scientific contributions led to the development of these companies, astounding, a lot of contribution from him. And he obtained his PhD from IASC, Organic Chemistry during 2005, and with two postdocs, one from uh, New York and another from Harvard. Uh, he is a faculty at INSTEM since 2013 till today. So now we are here, so we need to welcome him. So on behalf of all of you, and I request our beloved Dean, Postgraduate Studies to welcome him, providing a bouquet. Thank you so much for those kind words. Uh, good evening, everyone. So at the outset, you know, I would like to thank all the organizers for giving me this opportunity to come and share some of our thoughts on this particular topic. And as I mentioned, like uh, I'm a faculty at Institute for Stem Cell Biology and Regenerative Medicine, which is practically your neighbor. We're located in the same campus, and it's great to be here today. So when you talk about science and society, right, or science for society, I truly believe that the passionate scientists, with the help of great team of people, they can do a lot more contribution to society and improve the quality of life of people through research and innovation. 
And particularly today what I do is I'll take like some of our own example to show like what in a small way we are trying to contribute to improve the quality of life of people. So my lab at INSTEM, we primarily focused on clinical translational research. So when you say translational research, it's like uh, taking your ideas, converting into technologies, converting them into as a viable product to reach to the end user to solve unmet needs, right? So uh, this is the logo, uh, logo above our lab, like which uh, very nicely captured the essence of our lab philosophy. What we do is we, this is the V is not Vimla lab, but like uh, it's a valley of death that exists in clinical translational research. And uh, we develop this chemical and biotechnologies to cross this valley of death and reach to the people and in improve the quality of life of people. Uh, and we want to contribute in human health as well as veterinary and agriculture sciences. And past six years, we have been focused primarily on the human health. Maybe in coming five years, we might be focusing more on the agriculture and veterinary applications. So, but like interestingly, if you see the, the overall throughout world, like if you think about the translational science that people do in academics, we have very fraction of successful examples in the lab. Uh, the scientists who run through entire from lab to idea stage to the product stage and really solving the problems, right? Now the question is why that? So why only small portion of labs can do this entire thing? Is there any magic recipe in that, right? So to be honest, like there is nothing magic in that. It's only like the skill set and uh, uh, the, on your journey, what you learn, how you take people along with you and do this job well, very well, that, right? So fortunately, like uh, I had experience with uh, observing people like we has din did this like, you know, multiple times and by observing them and also with our own examples with the last 15 years, I came up with the, like, uh, there is a four rules, four critical rules, which plays major role in terms of doing the very good translational science. So today I would like to share with all those four rules how they can play a major role in doing a very successful clinical translational research. The rule number one, you know, identifying an unmet need, right? So because in a research, like uh, if you ask a right question, 50% of the success comes from right there, right? Because if you select either right problem or wrong problem, to solve that, you will spend same amount of money, resources, time, and energy, right? So might as well spend for a good cause. So that's why it's absolutely critical to identify what problem you're planning to work on, or what problem you're trying to solve. But when you think about unmet need, so then the dilemma comes, whether do you need to focus on global needs or the local needs, right? And either of them are good. So there is, both of them have their merits and demerits. While doing your global needs, you might have the much broader impact, but the approach you solve your problems might be very different when you want to solve local needs versus your global needs. So one needs to differentiate and have that differentiation right from the beginning itself, right? So as a scientist, like we have a habit of like, you know, identifying the problems based on our own skill set. We live in like very comfort zone, right? What we can solve, we try to pick that, which is good because that's where we can have the maximum contributions. But I think if you step back and see, rather than what we can do, so what needs to be done? I think you select a problem based on that. And if you select that problem, if you can't do it yourself, because translation science never been one person show, right? It's always a multidisciplinary team as people mentioned before. So, then you bring the people because you're stretching your zone, then bring the people with the multidisciplinary and you work with and develop collaborations, work to get, uh, together to solve this problem. So I'll just show you like one of our unmet need what we are planning to develop or we have been working on is like, as you know, like, you know, Indian farmers use more than 40,000 metric tons of pesticide every year. And you all know that, you know, pesticides are neurotoxin, they are designed to kill pests. But unfortunately, they don't discriminate between pest and human, right? If a human get exposed to the same chemical, they have same toxicity and similar side effects. So then we thought like, you know, can we solve this problem? But if you see, as I mentioned again, when you have the global and local needs, you need to approach in a different manner to solve these problems. For example, because uh, all these pesticides, not only Indian farmers are developing countries farmers, right? All, all over the world people use it. But if you see the farming practices done in uh, developed countries, an average of farmer in developed countries was much larger 
land, right? So they can easily adopt, you know, high-end technologies to use the motorized machines to spray these pesticides, right? So your manual exposure is minimal uh, in these cases. But on the contrary, people in India and also developing countries, average farmer owns like a very small uh, amount of land, so which uh, they don't uh, enable to use such adopt such technology. That's why like people typically take this motorized pumps and that's how they spray, right? It's almost like a, without having any protection and whatsoever. So it's like a walking under poisonous rain. And when you do so, uh, all these pesticides they deposit on the skin and they can inhale and they have severe side effect, right? So we thought like, you know, can we solve this problem? But again, we need to be a little more objective, right? Like uh, then we had a question like, is it a big problem? Is it, does this problem really exist? So then, you know, as any scientists do, we go back and, you know, try to read the whatever research has been done before, whatever the information you have, the, all the con conventional information you collect and try to come up with the problem, right? So uh, interestingly, like uh, all the research or all the information that was existing prior to this suggests that uh, although they are toxic, but people have to get exposed to like a decades. When you have this such a chronic exposure, they might start showing some symptoms. That's what it concludes. Then uh, that surprised us. Like uh, instead of completely believing that, we thought like, uh, why don't we gather our own information? So because uh, if you have a doubt, even if you want to question the dogma, so be it, right? So that's where what we thought, instead of doing that, like we wanted to go to the field and get our first hand information. So to do so, like we went to Telangana, visited almost 60 villages, spent almost like eight months in the field and interacted with 200 farmers and each of them, their field we visited to understand what kind of pesticide they use and what, what kind of uh, spraying methods they use. Do they use any protective measures or so on? And what kind of uh, uh, toxicity they have if they get exposed? And I think that's one of the best decisions we have ever made because it has completely changed the paradigm of our understanding of the pesticide toxicity. And contrary to the, your talk, uh, chronic exposure, we found out that all these guys, like majority of them, they have the acute toxicity. The day they spray from the same evening onwards, they see the side effects. Depend upon the dose, they have like, you know, eye fever, muscle pain, diarrhea, vomiting, and, you know, you know breathing disorders. If the dose is higher, it can lead to, you know, uh, convulsions and, you know, tremors and so on. And today there is no single technology to protect them. Right? So just to give you the example, the severity of this problem exists. If you take in 2017, in a matter of like a few months, there's almost 60 people lost their lives and more than thousands of farmers hospitalized uh, due to exposure while spraying in the cotton fields in Yavatmal, right? So that shows the problem that unmet need that exists and the lack of technology to protect them, so on. So that's where then we had, uh, I thought like, you know, this is actually a really a good problem to solve and it needs to be solved because you and me can fall sick, that is natural, right? But as a part of occupational hazard, like someone lose their life, it's completely unacceptable, right? For a, in a, any sector of the society. So that's where we thought like, you know, it's a huge unmet need and absolutely there is no technology to protect. So we thought like we can, you know, uh, allocate our resources, our time and develop some of the technologies. That brings to you the second rule in the translational science. That is, you know, build a stellar team. You know, as our previous speaker really told like about how the multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary is highly important. And it is absolutely critical to uh, build a team like which is absolutely necessary to bring all pieces of the puzzle together. So these are some of the people like uh, who are working on this, like, you know, this consists of like postdoctoral researchers, graduate scholars and masters and, uh, 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 biotech students, and also like from completely different backgrounds. So uh, there are chemists and biologists, bioengineers, you know, biotechnologists and chemical engineers and clinicians and medical students and so on. So then we thought like, you know, uh, we spent like a few years to develop this technology and just I'll give you the quick conceptual idea of what we are planning to do is, for example, when you have the pesticide, when it falls on the skin, it goes through the skin and it goes and binds to the enzyme called acetylcholinesterase. Yeah, this is the enzyme which plays your major function in your neuromuscular junctions, right? At the synapse. And if you, uh, these compounds go and bind to it in an irreversible manner. Basically, it kills the enzyme. It inhibits completely. That leads to the, all the side effect that cause, right? So then our idea is like, you know, develop a skin gel, so, which can be used like your moisturizer, 
but and it's not a physical gel because physical barriers can't stop this pesticide penetrating to them. That's why we wanted to develop a chemical gel. It's, a, it's like a chemical scissor. You put them on the skin. What it does, it has the ability to you know, covalently attack these pesticides and break down into non-harmful products. And these hydrolyzed products no longer have the ability to inhibit the enzyme. That means like it cannot induce any toxicity anymore. That's overall the concept what we are trying to put it. And fast forward you know, three years, and we could able to develop the, uh, a skin gel which has the multiple parameters because as you know, like, uh, there are like numerous types of pesticides out there, organophosphate, organochlorines, and carbamates, and pyrethrins, and so on. And you want to have one solution for that because you're targeting farmers and they can't see everyone, see the label and you know, select, if you have 10 different solutions, select based on that. Informed decision, they cannot make it. So that's why you want to have one single solution which can work for all. So that's where we have done like multiple iterations going through and optimize one gel which can act against all the pesticides. And also like you have to see the uh, climate conditions, right? Because uh, this reaction is completely temperature dependent. That's why like, uh, because it should work in a hot summers and cold winters and so on. And we could able to develop one single system. It works in entire gamut of the uh, temperature conditions. And also like uh, most of these chemicals are like, they're highly unstable, uh, the heat sensitive and uh, under UV light and uh, sunlight they go. But all the farmers, they do work on the under sun. So, uh, finally, again, we developed a system which can have all these properties together, which can work. Just to give an example, you know, uh, just to show, I, I'm not putting all the technical data, I'll just give you the conceptual one, uh, some key data. For example, you take any animals, you uh, uh, spray all the pesticides in a little dose, one single day, all of them, they lose their life. So you, you see the zero survival. But uh, before spraying your pesticide, if you apply your gel, and you can up, uh, spray your lethal dose of gel, every uh, pesticide, every single day for even for one week continuously spray, you don't see any uh, uh, losing lives at all, which clearly suggests the robustness of the gel to protect uh, from this uh, pesticide induced uh, lethality. And also like, uh, as I mentioned, these are highly neurotoxins, right, pesticides. So when they go and damage your neuromuscular junctions, these people lose their neuromuscular function. Their endurance goes down. They cannot do any more physical activity. But as you know, like, you know, farming is high, demands high physical activity, so their entire productivity goes down. So we have shown that in animals, like once you have this uh, protective gel, you can completely prevent such loss of endurance and you can protect from neuromuscular dysfunction and so on. And another aspect is, for example, like uh, when you uh, this is like, you can measure the neuronal activity. For example, if you put an uh, electrode here, you can see the signal passing here. And if your brain is not actively sending any signal and you don't see any signal here, right? That means you're not really moving your muscle and so on. But same thing if you do to a farmer who just got exposed to the pesticide, and although he's not actively moving any signal, he's not doing any physical activity, you can see a lot of signal firing, neurons are firing because you damage the, your enzyme, right? So it's a continuous, these are involuntary movements of your neurons. So it's always firing. That's one of the reasons like why when they get exposed, they can't control their movements. That's why people have the tremors and convulsions and so on, right? So then we have shown that, but having this gel, we can completely prevent such neuronal, uh, involuntary signals and neuronal damage. So. Then we thought like we had a <clears throat> aha moment, you know, we developed a skin gel which can apply it and which can completely prevent the loss of this one. So then uh, what we thought is like, uh, although like scientifically they are good, it worked very well, but like, you know, unless you think from a end user point of view, you don't know whether you developed the right solution or not. So in order to test that, you know, we wanted to get the feedback from the stakeholders and hear our farmers, right? So that's where, you know, with uh, all the Krishimela used to come and like, you know, display this product and, you know, get the real-time feedback from all these farmers. And that was uh, outstanding. Like, uh, again, like it has completely changed uh, our way of thinking. Although like many people appreciate it, like one gentleman asked us, uh, it works very well, great, but like, you know, you have to apply throughout the body every single time you go to the field when you use the pesticide. Not everyone might be like uh, comfortable to doing so. So end of the day, you might have the less compliance. 
So that has completely changed our way of thinking. I thought like, you know, we might to develop much more user-friendly solution where every farmer can adopt. So the best way to have is address, right? So, uh, but typically what happens like uh, your normal uh, cotton dress, people generally they wear cotton and they think that having a, you know, a rumal and cotton fabric will prevent and they pull, wrap it around. But in reality, that actually it increases your, this one, because it soaks every pesticide, it keeps a longer time on the skin, you get much more higher. So that's where we developed the cotton fabric, which is this is chemically modified fabric. Now like a skin gel, now this fabric has the ability to chemically completely break down all your pesticide compounds in a non-active compounds. So this can be stitched as your uh, a gown or like a pyjama, shirt and mask and so on. So in the open area still they can put a little bit cream but like they can wear this dress. And this dress we have shown that like it could be completely reusable, washable. One single dress can come for one year uh, with repeated uses. So that's where we are because uh, together now we wanted to with the cream and this one, our mission is to protect every single farmer in India and also developing countries from the pesticide induced toxicity. So that's where we are moving forward for further development. And uh, as I told, I told like there are four rules, right? Uh, but uh, I showed you only three rules so far. Before discussing fourth rule, which is another critical rule, I want to show like one more example where we put our efforts to develop biomaterials for treatment of inflammatory disorders. It's a completely different application. As you know, like uh, inflammation inherent part of majority of the diseases, chronic disorders like you know, lupus, colitis, Crohn's and so on. But we do have like a very potent anti-inflammatory uh, drugs, right? Despite having uh, anti-inflammatory drugs, if you see the therapeutic outcome from treatment of these disorders are very poor. The primary reason for this is, if you see the nature of the disease, it's the nature of inflammation, is highly fluctuated. It's never like you have, once a disease comes, it's a consistent and it goes down. So you have the increased period, you have the steady state, you have remission period, occasional flare-ups and so on. And unfortunately, we do not have any reliable non-invasive diagnosis testing to measure a patient how much inflammation a person has at that particular point of time. Right? So that's why delivering drugs would be very difficult for these patients. So we thought like, you know, can we come up with one of the uh, platform technologies to deliver these drugs which can solve this inflammation problem. So then you can use for every single inflammatory disorders by using that method. So, so but if you step back and see like almost, you know, seven decades of drug delivery history, there are two major breakthrough concepts have been developed. The first one being developing the excipient based compounds because most of the drugs are not soluble. So they use the small molecular excipients to solubilize and deliver them. So for example, if you give a single dose administration, uh, given the combination of your excipients and drugs, it keeps the drug in a therapeutic window for a certain period of time. When it dose goes down to subtherapeutic level, you give another dose and so on. No, that's how your doctor suggests you whether you have to take medication once in a day or twice in a day or so on, right? Because if you take uh, earlier than you uh, prescribe, then your concentration goes way high, it becomes toxic. But if you delay your dose, it becomes ineffective. So that's why we need to follow the regime what they prescribe. So, but in that way, it's a great for treating acute diseases, like where you can take medication for a few days to a week or so. But like when you have to take chronic inflammatory disorders and all, like where you have to take medication like, you know, for weeks and months and so on, several months, it's difficult for many of us to like without missing uh, doses and uh, stick to that regime, right? So to solve that problem, late 70s, people have come up with the sustained drug delivery methods where you take the drug and encapsulate it into these nanomaterials and biomaterials. With a single dose administration, they start controlling release the drug and keep the concentration of your drug in therapeutic window long period of time. So in that way, like the chronic disorders can be uh, treated. So these two way of delivering drugs has revolutionized the way you treat the patients, right? But unfortunately, if you see the inflammatory disorders, as I told you, the level of disease itself is fluctuated and it varies from patient to patient. And either way of giving drugs, they don't work because either you end up with overdosing the patient or underdosing the patients, right? Then what is the ideal solution? Ideal solution way to deliver drugs would be identical to the level of disease, which means when the disease comes, it should start releasing the drug. When disease goes down, it stops releasing. If it comes back again, it should release, right? But as I mentioned, like we do not have a reliable diagnostic way to measure the level of inflammation. 
how we can incorporate these properties into any materials. It's impossible, right? So only way to do this is if you put the drug delivery inside, if the disease itself can control and design when to release the drug and how much to release the drug, then it's an autonomous manner, disease should control and release the drug. That's the overall concept what we have been developing. So how we do that so? For example, when you have the disease, so under disease condition they produce you know, a biomarker. So this could be an enzyme, cytokine, peptide, protein, anything, right? Now you develop a drug delivery system which can implant your body, inject them, but in the absence of this biomarker, that means in the absence of this disease, you shouldn't release the drug in a non-specific manner. But if, when it comes in contact with the biomarker, that should you know, degrade your gel and or biomaterials should start releasing the drug. And the release drug goes and elevate the disease that stop producing the biomarker that stop degrading your gel system. Right? So in that way, this is controls when to release the drug and how much to release to the drug, so on. So that's the overall concept what we have developed like past six years. And uh, I don't go into details, but like we use this concept as a framework to solve multiple medical applications. For example, we use for treatment of inflammatory arthritis. Because as you know, arthritis is primarily affect your joints and people directly inject uh, your drugs into the joint, but like they don't remain there, right? They just diffuses out. So we can encapsulate into these biomaterials and inject them and they remain there for like six months where single injection can remain for six months and release the drug only when the arthritis flare comes, right? Otherwise they remain stable. And similar concept you use for the treatment of inflammatory bowel disease for the Crohn's and uh, colitis. And also, like we also showed that this could be used to protect the transplanted organs because we use for the hand transplantation uh, models where like in you know, a post-transplantation, your body try to reject foreign organs. So you have to do the immunosuppressants you have to provide to control your immune system. So that's where like again, immune activation also is uh, highly sporadic, right? So that's where we developed the system which can uh, resonate with the immune activation and release the drug in a uh, controlled manner. That's how like we could able to protect them. So we put all this uh, together and that's where like, uh, again, if you see uh, these cases also, you know, we found an unmet need because uh, delivering drugs to inflammatory disease is impossible thus far. So we could able to find that unmet need. And again, with a stellar team of clinicians and all, we developed this. And during this entire development process, we had a constant dialogue with the clinicians and the patients to get their feedback, to refine our design strategy and so on. So that brings to the fourth rule, important rule, that is be flexible in your approach. So what does that mean, right? So uh, this is the classical depiction of value of death that exists in a clinical translational research. It's irony that majority of your scientific innovation, breakthrough science, they remain in the laboratory. They're not able to cross this valley of death reach to people, right? So uh, that's where like, uh, you can use all your scientific knowledge to still develop your breakthrough science here, but then how to convert them into there. That's where your fourth rule comes. Very important step to do a very successful entrepreneurship program. Right? in order to do further development and convert them into a viable product to reach to the people. And uh, why I said be flexible in the sense, like uh, as a scientist, like, uh, you know, we come with skill set, we are not equipped with this, right? So one way to do is like, okay, we don't know anything, then remain there, anyone comes and take it. More often it doesn't happen, that's why they remain there, right? So I think we can go out of our comfort zone and learn some of the basic things about entrepreneurship or the build a team or find the right people who can do this job much better than you. Bring them into team and work together, develop this, right? So then you can cross this bridge and valley and reach the people. So just to summarize, like by the first step, what we did is focused on the developing technologies. I divided them into three. In the therapeutic biomaterial, as I mentioned, these are inflammatory responsive material we could able to show for multiple medical applications. We use this one. The second one is the preventing biomaterial where we could able to develop the skin gels and you know, protective cloth for preventing pesticide exposure into farmers. And third, I didn't have the choice to talk today, but like we also developed this potential small molecular based drugs. These are the new drugs could be used for the treatment of IBDs. So after developing this gamut of technologies, now we have been like uh, uh, very actively involved in that entrepreneurship as well. And uh, then uh, each one of the platform led to different uh, ventures, like uh, based on this therapeutic biomaterials, we formed a company in Boston. This has been like four years. It's one of the fastest growing company in the US. Now the value
to take to the further. So our idea is like we are working with the DCGA and CDC SCO to get the permission to run the human trials maybe by end of this year or 2020, we are planning to start that. And based on this new chemical entity, we formed another startup company in Artis uh, in the Boston, where like uh, right now we are focused on completely uh, doing all the safety studies and uh, preclinical safety and tox studies. And so if you see all this, right, like uh, <clears throat> when you develop your technology aiming to solve the problem that have like societal impact. So you are not only developing knowledge, but you can also develop wealth, right? And uh, by doing that, so again, like you develop jobs. So together, these companies, more than 100 jobs have been created and people have hired. So then we, all these things can go in hand in hand. So our idea is like, you know, we can focus on doing science which have the direct impact on the society by, and this, it's a, not a random journey. So there are some of the basic rules if you follow, I think anyone can do this. So that's the, uh, whatever distilled thoughts, what we have, we put it together. As I said, you know, when you do this, you know, you have the, you can generate the knowledge and this knowledge also creates the wealth and take the wealth and invest in developing another knowledge, more knowledge. So this would be close dependent, right? Like, you know, Lakshmi Saraswati can go together, why not, right? So that's the overall idea. And uh, I think I, I stop here. This is our small journey. And I'd like to thank all the people who, who have shown the pictures before who are doing this amazing job. And also thank you all of you for your kind attention. Thank you. It was a very well, very thank, thought-provoking panel discussion talk by Praveen Kumar Vemula. So now we have come to the uh, end of our panel discussion presentations. Now I request all the panelists uh, to be on to the dais to address uh, our gathering here and to receive a few questions for the discussion in case. I request uh, Professor Anurag, Madam and also uh, Professor Vemula. So you, we have heard a lot about uh, the panel discussion on science for society, or science and society. So of course, uh, societal impact, especially with the benefit of science, so now it is the uh, time for the students to interact and uh, take part in the discussion, especially on these aspects. So feel free to discuss. Madam already said there should, be, there, should be, there should not be any kind of inhibitions among the students to ask questions. So we are proud that we have a very good number of students with inquisitiveness uh, to ask questions or involve in the panel discussion. Yes, please. Yeah. Mic, please. Ah, here. One, two, three. Please uh, mention your name and also the address uh, specific questions to the yes, panel. Sir,
also use the word belief uh, when you were asking my question. And this is something which is uh, extremely important, the whole notion of belief. Do you believe in science uh, or do you practice science? Do you believe, do you believe in religion or do you practice religion? Uh, well, there's a very complex uh, issue that you have raised, but uh, I think uh, the whole subject of religion will have to be analyzed. What do we mean by it? Because religion need not only mean a practice of certain rituals, observations of certain uh, you know, ceremonies and so on. Religion can also be a community builder. It can also be a motivator to come together. It can also be a reinforcing force for a few people to work together for a higher force, which could be labeled as scientific or whatever. So, uh, I think the challenge would be to re-look at science, uh, sorry, at, uh, at religion, as more as an enforcing, motivating change agent than perhaps a debilitating, manipulative, or uh, you know, kind of a cliched uh, topic. Many of I, I, I do understand what you have behind your that question. It's unfortunate that. Uh, uh, you know, we club the whole methodology of religion and science mm -hmm. and are able to distinguish between the two. But I think it's extremely important to know what is the methodology adopted by religion, what is the methodology adopted by science. I don't think the methodologies can be the same, but I think the larger goal has to be the same, which is the human well-being. And if we are not achieving that, both are failing. Thanks. That is fine. Science has a different enterprise, has a different purpose, religion has a different purpose. I don't think by giving up religion, science is going to do better. Or that's, it's not one for the other. It's not that a sacrifice which we are talking about. I think the essential idea is not mixing up the methodology of both and saying that it's the practice of religion or certain observations of that you can achieve certain scientific results. That is definitely not what we are intending. But in your life, if a particular religious practice is going to bring in self-transformation, making you a better person or able to help you understand another person better, bring in compassion to you, bring in love for your neighbor, I would think that is very much needed, whether it's a goal of self, uh, science or religion. So what we are perhaps uh, critiquing here is mixing up the methodologies, but I think as independent disciplines, everything has its place. And I think that is something which is very important, to see the place of everything in its own place and not misplacing it uh, or displacing it. So I don't think displacing something you will achieve the goal of another thing. Actually, it is by placing everything in its own seat that which we are going to attain the final purpose. <laughs> Religion is something, or spirituality, that's your, I think, as you rightly mentioned, it's a personal development. If that can, if I say, okay, if I practice, if I believe spirituality or religion, so it should give me the confidence that, okay, I can do stuff and it will work for 
that's a personal confidence what you can try or derive from practicing this. Because we go for doing science. We have more than 95% failures. You need that tenacity and you know, uh, like uh, you know, persistence to go and go after this. So if you can derive the persistence or the confidence or willingness from either practice in religion or spiritual or whatever means, that should help for you. So that's why I believe. But not me not be overlap to help each other. You know? But in science you know that you are failing. But I would I would tend to agree with uh, Professor Agora and uh, I request uh, Professor Sanjit of Kai further because religion and science uh, spirituality is something different. It's it can't be the same as, as religion. Can be different. You asked me about religion or religion, religion, religion. No, because of religion. Religion. Because when you mention spirituality, I say it gives us a spirituality. It's only religion. So religion and uh, science. So it is like, and we are right here. The goal is the same. We are not having the same railways, but the two rails shall not meet. So that's the simple way. And Stephen Jay Gould put it very eloquently. When he said, "These are not overlapping necessarily," and when he said the methodologies are different, I think they can never meet, even though the goal is same. But can I ask you? Yeah. I want to ask you a question. Yes, please. What is your opinion? Take the mic. Can you hear me? Take the mic. Mic, mic. Yes. What's your opinion? See, he's very clear. He wants to find out. What of us will argue about it? What's your opinion? And I'm sorry to hear this one. Of the Indian Natural Science Congress, where a lot of claims are made about India being the first uh, country in which rescue uh, babies were done, the first in which a head transplant was done, in the to the nation, and uh, other, you know, the, the flying machines. Do you believe there's a space for that kind of uh, discourse? And Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. That's all. Yeah, questions from student side? Yeah. Sorry. Mike, please. Left side. Oh, sir. Just, just a minute, Mike. So, I just want to close, sum up in the way I perceive it. And you can't be showing religion. It's already there. So, the better way to do it is if it is really helping mankind to find a solace for people to observe religion, and science can also go around with it. In some ways, he said both are on different tracks, so it can't match. But I believe you can't be showing it. So, the best thing to do is. I think they should be compromised with some. Both in both. It's called soap. Both in half. May not be. Both are harmful. 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 Both are Please, yeah. Please mention your name and uh, address your question to this. Bit loudly, please. <laughs> okay. So I did select this intervention. What happened was in the 70s and 80s, there was a lot of this happening where these, uh, especially the Scandinavian countries, they came to India and they adopted a lot of children who were very, very badly off. And then in Scandinavia, they followed them up and it was published. Mm. So was, uh, around the time I began to do medicine, so I wasn't involved in that intervention. It's just people that was published. But I do use it to say only one thing. And I think, uh, if I may, uh, I know there's an expert philosopher here, and I shouldn't get into these, but I want to get a little into this point later. I, I think you, wherever we do things, I and mean, when I was a student and as I moved on in life, I often battled with the question of what is research, what's the meaning of novelty, what are these things? And all of you, as I'm sure, if you get into research, you will battle 
exactly the same question. For example, if you find a paper where someone has published something, you ask yourself, well, I have a little idea that could be a little change in that hypothesis or method, so can I repeat it in India? And many people ask me, isn't that just derivative and repetitive research? Now, I urge you to go online and try and find two, two people. They're both philosophers. One is called Karl Popper. He is a very popular philosopher of science in my day. And he would reject the notion that you could prove anything. His, his whole thing was he always did science to disprove things, but he could never come out saying I proved something first. And the other is a person called Thomas Kuhn from Germany who, who had the opposite. And he felt that science would just go on and on in a way where you would take evidence like this evidence I've shown you, but if you incrementally keep getting that evidence together, then he called what you create what they call a paradigm shift. Right now in India, I believe we are in the throes of singular events, where everyone is looking for those singularities that can change the world. I'm not sure these singularities exist. I suppose WhatsApp can be considered a singularity that causes riots, but eventually I believe for the good of society, I'm not sure there is a singularity. It is a, it is a Kuhnian world of, of a paradigm shift where you keep grinding away, finding incremental changes. I, I want to ask you back now, what would you prefer? I mean, I'm going to say, I, I didn't do that, I didn't choose Sweden, so I'm answering that question, but I do want to ask you back a question. That, do you think we should repeat this experiment? Do you think we should do it? For example, I'd like to know because tell me if you're a popular or a cool Once again, in India, by providing good environment. By providing good environment, where it is, and uh, giving good quality of food, and uh, as a love and affection is already present in India, it can be given and uh, taken as a longitudinal studies. So you're saying yes or no? Any other questions from the student side? Yeah, here, in the your front. First of all, before starting my questions, I would like to thank all the organizers for, uh, for, uh, making, us, for making us able to... Please, please mention your name. It's only milk that is, that's why I, I laugh at this because milk is an animal protein. Mm -hmm. 
And I wonder what makes you think that you're not eating animal foods if you're really eating them. I don't feel like eating them. Well, because it is an animal food. It comes out of an animal. I, I just uh, want to ask whether the human body is designed to... Uh, it, it is not. Actually, if you, if you look at the digestive systems, uh, meat, I don't say meat is good for you, right? I'm not saying that. I think everything in proportion, everything in moderation, including moderation, is a good thing. The thing is, we, is we digest meat much easier because the cell wall is a lipid structure. Plant proteins are cellulose and can much harder to break up. As a result, if you take a plant and you pulverize it, you pass it through your food, you that science person, then you pass it through an extruder. You know what an extruder is? Extruding. You never know of an extruder? Oh, good for you. So you pass it through that, you make it into the tiniest possible particles, and then you eat it, you will absorb it. That's well. I'm asking you, if you eat food in its natural state, put it in your chew it and it's all right, it's likely you will, you will digest the animal product far better than the plant product. Does that answer your question? Are you going to pick up a non vegetarian? <laughs> My second question is that uh, your research in your presentation you have shown that there is uh, like plant protein that like digestibility is only 60%. Uh, and uh, as I said earlier, I want to be a vegetarian. If I want to be a vegetarian and consume good amount of protein, rather than doubling the pro protein intake, uh, is there any research or any works have been done that uh, you can increase the protein, plant protein digestibility in human doctor? That would be a good question. That's a good question too. <laughs> Very good question and the answer provided by the, our panelists too. Any questions? Yeah, here. related aspect or only to uh, not necessarily anti pesticide entire uh, drugs related aspect so regarding the best side I tell you like uh, there is no drug in anti pesticide one what we are trying to do mm. is like uh, this is a prevention method okay because the person is not taking anything in okay this will be just applied on the skin and like it or it reacts with the pesticide and damages them or breaks down simply. But this itself doesn't go into the body. So you never get exposed to the number of what we get up. So there's nothing like we are consuming. Even in cloth, the snow chemical goes inside. It's everything sick to the cloth in the body. So regarding whether you want to develop drugs for any other disease, or that's not a question. I told you. That's a good term. Any other questions or last person? Person who is sitting in the back, please move that side. Please, please move that. Mic is not working. So 
you, you please come here. Come to the dais. Please come on. Uh -huh. uh, thank you, panelists, for your time. My name is Joseph Esimu from the Department of Plant and Technology. Uh, my question is to all of you, the panelists. Uh, do you think in the last 20 years, science has been a success or a failure? <laughs> no. Thank you for that very important question. And I think the frame, time frame which you took is also very important. And it's particularly important for me from my discipline, which is cognitive science and consciousness studies. So I can answer from the point of view of that particular sub-discipline. This is a huge success because uh, the whole problem of consciousness Consciousness and cognition like one, like itself was considered more as an aspect of humanities and social sciences. But today, uh, the coming together of various sub-disciplines in neuroscience, and particularly neurophenomenology and neuropsychology, has brought in a lot of nuances in understanding our own mind, the way we behave, our attitude, our responses, our choice making. The young girl was so dominant, you know, saying the ways I would like to be vegetarian. I think that choice making is what is going to lead to good science because we don't want people who are obeying certain paradigms. We want to have people who dissent and to take an alternate path. Anyway, leaving that <laughs> remark aside. So I would think uh, in cognitive science and consciousness, it's a huge shift because today the problem of identity uh, is almost a scientific question. I wouldn't say it's a scientific question, but it's almost a scientific in, in my own field, I don't know that you are aware of, the larger question is that how does the discrete physical quantitative neural processes bind together to give rise to a subjective, unitary, and qualitative phenomenon called you and me? This is a very scientific question. 20 years before, you wouldn't even think of such a question. But today, this is a very, very important question. And this question is cannot be given up by any subfields of neuroscience. Thank you. Doctor uh, Kameen Bimla, uh, you are in the process of developing a kind of plot uh, which can protect uh, the farmers from the effect of uh, pesticides. And you said once a plot is stitched, it can be used for one year. So, how much it costs? I mean, whether farmers can afford it, the gel or the cloth? Uh, yeah, we are like not aware of the you know cost issue because like we are targeting someone like who has less purchase power. Uh, this is too early to put a cost on it because a lot of development process needs to be done. Uh, but like uh, we are making sure that like and this would be affordable for the farmers. For example, like maybe. A suit for like you know, couple of thousand for a year like it's it's a pretty much affordable. But like a, this is a little early I would say uh, to put an exact price on that. But we are from day one we are aware of that fact that we are targeting to this segment where uh, you need to keep the costs as low as possible. But that's right. Any questions, please? And maybe uh, just I would like to ask the first question, the previous Joseph yes. question. Uh, you know, if I don't believe science is like I couldn't be here today, okay, so, and I think how many of you last five years or three years went to doctor and got the medicine? All of you? If you went there, you believe science. That's what I do. My friend there, do you have this? Do you have it? Can you show it? Yeah, see, science. 
Do you agree? This is one thing. This, this body that you see before you is also proof of science. I would not have been here but for science. I would have died 30 years. There are no problems. Hi, I'm Sindhu. Uh, my question is to Dr. Sangeeta. Uh, you, you talked about ethics. Who, who decides and how do you decide what, what is ethical? that you asked me who decides, decides that you So that is the deciding power and trust. You decide, I decide, every one of us decides. Our problem is we are always looking at a hierarchical power. Even when we are kind of denouncing any kind of extremism, we forget that we are embracing another form of extremism. Because any form of finality is a sort of extremism. And I think that needs a lot of self-reflection. That is why any choice making is important. The choice making, you may say, say it is wrong, right, in between or whatever, but the making a person empowered to make a choice, I think that is the final purpose of ethics. If ethics is not doing that, you are not making people empowered. If people are not empowered, they don't make choices. If they don't make choices, you and I get to rule upon them and to give dictums upon them how they should be living or how they should be behaving. In all extremist manner, I would think that that is not what we want. So I wouldn't endorse non-vegetarianism to a vegetarian, quite frankly. That is her choice to be a vegetarian. And I think her question that how can she perhaps be a vegetarian and still have enough uh, of protein, that is a very valid question. So the problem comes and it becomes political when someone Arts up on my choices and say, you make you change your choice for your better. No, who is to decide what is good for me? Finally, I would think I have to decide what is good for me. You may consider it is wrong. It doesn't matter. To me, it is right. And I think that belief in that individual rightness is extremely important. Because we live in a free society. A free society makes us to make independent choices. If we are not able to make independent choices, I don't think we are free. We can never be free. Actually, uh, I, so I want to actually take on the Dr. Sangeeta. The first thing is um, individual choice is individual choice. You're right. I have, I have the freedom and the choice to ask you, would you like to be a non-vegetarian? And you have the freedom and the choice to say, no, I don't want to be. So these are irrelevant sort of discussions. Here's the point. To me, <coughs> ethics is all about, and particularly public health ethics, I think the problem for me is making choices for yourself depends on information. If you don't know, and if we don't give you that information, I wonder whether you feel you were equitably disposed to make your choice. Let me give you an example. The government decides to fortify salt, rice, maybe wheat, maybe some biscuits with iron. And onion and onion. <laughs> we'll come to that. We'll come to that. They decide to fortify. Okay, and this gets put into the PDS. So it's given at a shop at a, at a cheaper price. The people who are eating that are told this is good for your anemia. However, they are not told that there is a tolerable upper limit of intake of iron which you might exceed. And look, you should think about what you're eating. So your choices are dependent on the knowledge you have. Knowledge is power in today's world. 
So to me, since of the question you asked, who decides? I think it's also dependent on who knows enough to decide. And I'm not sure this is an easy question to answer, but one thing is clear. My good intentions, more bad, stop at your nose. In other words, I can decide for myself, but I should not decide for you. I can question. Questioning is a great thing to do. It does not mean I'm deciding. You, can, you have to make that decision. Not at all. Look, I, I think we should we should argue with each other. My point is that I feel that I would like Dr. Sangeeta to make more uh, forceful statements. Now she puts that to being a liberal is liberal, which is actually the position I come from, which is for me it doesn't matter what you say. I, I would like to just say this, that choices are your own, and eventually we, we all have the right to question each other with philosophy. We should question. The moment we stop questioning, we stop, to my mind, existing. It doesn't stop me from being a liberal. I'm completely liberal. Can I just say that? It's not. This is my problem. I'm not, that's what I'm saying. See, you can't, see, the government, I told you, data part I agree. But then to use that to build a position that I know better than you and that I know No, 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 no. No one is saying I know better. Yeah. I'm saying these are the facts. <laughs> now you decide. That's the point. I will never say and I know better. Nobody decides all the time. Whatever knowledge they have, they come back, they make choices. Correct. And then in public health, but in public health, and this goes to what that young man was asking about what do you think science has done. One of the problems about this is that the pace at which science has moved has outstripped the ability for people to understand these consequences. And as a result, we, have, we sometimes ask, are we going headlong into something? You, when you see a lady like Angelina Jolie cutting off both her breasts in mastectomy operations, because she was diagnosed, because she had the mutation that put her at risk of breast cancer. You ask yourself, well, is this what is what gonna happen? Did she have adequate knowledge before she did it? And sometimes you people take risky decisions. Uh, and who knows? Even that it went on incomplete knowledge. We don't know. That's my point. That's, that's my point. Can we all go ask? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I need to allow the others also. Shreshan is itching. Thanks for that fantastic two questions asked by the two girls about one on um, uh, the vegetarianism and then the religion kind of thing and you know the ethics issue. Now the question that we have is, you know, who decides? I completely agree with Tadora that anybody who has more knowledge Decides. You know, who what is decide? that? Decide? You decide for yourself. Yes, sure. I mean, the question that we have is, you know, there is. I think when you look at this, who has more knowledge to decide? And I think it is religion which is deciding for all of us, isn't it? That you know, Brahminical people shouldn't eat meat, and A shouldn't eat that, A B shouldn't eat beef, and you know, all those kind of things are. I think this is disturbing the society basically. I have a feeling that you decide what to do based on scientific knowledge, like how somebody asked Joseph asked when is the science a success? Of course. There's so much of information now, and you know, when compared to our time when I was a student in MSc, like you guys, and we had to go to the library to look for data, but now it is there in your, in your cell phone. You press the button, it comes. Yesterday we were talking about this. Now the question is that if you want to now ask, get information, the information depends on the question that you are querying. And if you press that correct keyword, you get billions of information that you want in the literature, and that is now making you powerful to decide. Now, can we decide based on scientific information rather than any other fancy? And the scientific information suggests certain things. You decide whether it is necessary to follow this way or that way, but it is an informed decision, and I take that. So I have the information to take the decision. But did I understand the information the way it should be? That's another question, isn't it? Now, who will decide all those? So that, can I give an example? Yes. So when HIV was first discovered, HIV, you know HIV? Right. When it was discovered, we as doctors, we had 
that sometimes we suspect that someone had HIV. And what do we do when you go to a doctor, they say, listen, I want to do some tests. And you give your blood and he, he ticks off some boxes on a form. You don't know what those boxes are and it goes. But it, with HIV, this was a problem because when patients were told, you have HIV, which, could, which will kill you eventually. In those days, there was no cure. Some of them went out and immediately committed suicide. Now, as a result, we were told, as young doctors, you will never order an HIV test unless you've got a psychiatrist or a psychologist to counsel that patient that, listen, we're going to be looking for this problem in you. You may have it. If you have it, this is the consequences. And even many patients would say, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. And that was their choice with the information they had. Now that is not being done in science today, and that's why the young man asked the right question, that the outstripping of technology is making it so hard for us to inform patients about this. It's really hard. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, there's this whole thing that the measles vaccine is linked with autism. And Donald Trump has now created a vaccine oversight committee which actually is going to look into the evidence. The fact is that, um, and you will know more about this, the vaccine that went to repair had an excipient in it. And that excipient was the chemical that they thought it was called thiomerosol, which was supposed to be linked to autism. Even that now has been disproved. But there is this strong, and I will use the word because I don't mind using such words, Christian ethic against uh, against uh, measles. The same thing happens in Pakistan when people are attacked for giving polio vaccines. This is very strongly rooted in religious beliefs. Now, I think these are all wrong, and unless the evidence is clear, we should hesitate because measles has killed too many children. It really has. And vaccination is a good thing. I have not, I, I agree, there is a risk of what we call a vaccine induced disease. But that's a very small risk, and I okay, now you can get me into ethics of saying, shouldn't you not take a risk down to zero? Yeah, yeah, we can have a long discussion. But you asked the right question. The information gap is just too much. I find it difficult to, to deal with. And that is where everything steps in and makes you. Of course. Of course. Maybe we can allow the last question from the group now. Still some more questions from the students? Oh, no. I, 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 question is, please. Okay. My question is, uh, in India, more than 50% of the population is normalized. This is uh, every day in the newspaper, it is being uh, uh, narrated by the, uh, what you call, uh, these uh, journalists. So now, uh, you have the alternative. Now, in India, uh, cheapest protein, uh, chicken, milk, and egg. Chicken, milk, and egg. Che cheapest protein is available. But it is having a little cholesterol. But Amartya Sen says that uh, Indian poverty mixed with uh, malnourishment is not due to deficient production, but due to Deficient purchasing power. Okay, I want your uh, opinion whether this small nourishment, uh, nourishment is only due to the uh, shortage of purchasing power uh, when the commodity is available at the cheapest state. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think that's what he quoted Amartya said. <laughs> Amartya Sen's theories were based on the famine, where he looked at the economics of famines, and under those conditions, yes, he found hoarding was a major problem, and people didn't have access to food, although production was there. Uh, uh, I think the Indian malnutrition scenario is to do with access to food, although, you know, when I look at, when I go, when I look at uh, the present Indian uh, I'll use the word again, political scenario. 
the political promises that are being made are like a race to the bottom. Should I have to keep quiet now, or what's going on? I thought you wanted to shut me up. I personally think that if you look at the Indian economy now and the political state, it's a race to the bottom with what, if you look at the promises political parties are making, they're saying we give you this, we give you that, it's almost becoming a subsidy state. Now under those conditions, if people are still managed, it points to great corruption in schemes that is going on. And when there is that, there is equally also a lack of access. I think from a production viewpoint, well, we are not producing as much as we should. Sure. But in general, if you look at the chicken poultry business, it is booming. It's going to become a major portion of our protein. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I have no questions from the students. Anura sir, my question is for you. Sir, you said that malnutrition is measured by looking at height and weight of the people. So, uh, why can't it be, like, heredity may also be a reason, heredity, heredity. So, how can we measure the malnutrition exactly, like, what is the procedure? Absolutely. Do we consider that heredity component also in that measurement? Not yet. So, what we do right now in India, at least in India, is that we just use data like uh, height of the whole population. What we would like as a target is not to bring that height deficit down to zero. It will never be because if approximately 10% of all of us here are hereditarily short. Now that's why in most nutrition programs we are aiming to get to 5 to 10% uh, short people, not zero percent. You can't. Then you'll never succeed. Right? Does that answer your question? It's just that it's easy to measure height and weight, okay? If I could, I would love to take a metabolomic, fecal microbiomic, genetic screen of everyone. I can diagnose my nutrition much better. Full weight. So this height and weight is costless as a measurement of society. Okay, thank you, sir. And Praveen, sir, another question. Uh, you know, mentioned about that, that skin gel. When we apply that gel, we can close the pores of our skin also, like sweat pores and all. You said that pesticide component won't go into our skin. Like, will it close the pores also? No, it doesn't. In fact, like it's designed to be like aerated because you need to have the sweat glands and all should work. So it doesn't. It doesn't. That's why. It then how can the pesticide? It won't go into our. Skin. So where will the sweat? It will stay. Like farmers will work no. Yeah, that's exactly because. If you want to make like a physical barrier, so it's like putting a plastic sheet on, then it will block your pores and all, right? So yes, this was not meant by that. Then how we can prevent this? Before it goes through the skin, so it's chemically deactivated, it's chemically reacts with the pesticide and breaks down it. Before it goes to the skin? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. My question is to Anurag sir. Uh, <laughs> sir, uh, the, my question is, uh, regard to your uh, that's why malnutrition what you uh, what you said so uh, actually uh, my question is how this policy level things policy level matters uh, policy level things and the adaption process of those policies uh, will they run on the same platform it's just like uh, to quote you an example there are some expert level committees where they decide that these are the things or policies that has to be adopted and the people who are adopting those policies are a different kind so my question is that Will they run on the same platform, or it is a different kind? And who is actually deciding all those? So health is a state subject. So when we sit at doing all our deliberations at Delhi and Niti Aayog, we can just make a regulation. Ultimately, the interpretation of that regulation and the operationalization of it is a state matter. See, it's completely a state. And, and are those people? They are. They are means. Uh, they are concerned to. Uh, your field or out, out of the field? It depends on states. You know, I think uh, the level of uh, I, I, look, should I say the C word? Yeah. Yeah. Corruption. Yeah. It's a big deal. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, eventually that's what determines what gets done. Actually, the, the people in Karnataka today 
uh, ones I've met at uh, the principal secretaries of uh, uh, women and child development and health are fantastic people. The people under them, their commissioners, fantastic people. They are frustrated with the amount of leakage that occurs at the district level and down to the final levels. And they are very good people. And I, you know how I know they're very good? Can you tell me how do you know a state bureaucrat is fantastic at their work? They think that what they're doing is, is right for them. No, they get transferred. <laughs> I think that's why the Latin is like, because I was going to wonder, because till now I do thought that the three years would be the type for joining a, you know, children to something of baby. It's such a, it seems so easy, right? Yeah. So now at last the Tata Trust have given us money, the Women and Child Development and the Ministry of Health and uh, the Panchayati Raj uh, Ministries have all joined together with us at Bangalore level to do uh, good evaluation and, and implementation in Dhanangare and uh, Chitra Taluks. I'm hoping it will work. But eventually, you know, I really think that that last mile, corruption is endemic in this country. I, I, I don't know if I can't say it in here. Thank you, sir. And uh, my next question is to Vimla, uh, sir. Uh, being, uh, since I'm an uh, entomology student, uh, out of curiosity, I'm asking this. Uh, so you told, uh, you, you said about that uh, anti-pesticide fabric. So, is there a compound? Uh, is it an impregnated loop, the fabric that you're using? Is it impregnated with some ke uh, some chemical? Because as you have mentioned, you know that it would inactivate uh, the pesticide, which is which is getting in contact with that fabric. Is there any compound that exists on that fabric which is impregnated that would make that uh, pesticide inactive? Is it so? Can I know what that compound is? <laughs> yeah, this is a problem. Building rockets and satellites and uh, performing puja and breaking coconut by launching them. They, they do it. Toxicity test that's been done for the gel that uh, has been prescribed to 
Uh, yes, we have done in, in fact, like, uh, this is according to Schedule Y that required for DCGI to do the toxicity and all. We have tested this toxicity in like, you know, uh, different species like mice, rat, guinea pigs, rabbits, and uh, not only like single dose that these are like repeated doses, several month exposure were tested. And also like, uh, uh, although we are using for skin, like dermatologist like, toxicity has done, but like we also tested like the oral toxicity Ocular toxicity because of by mistake if they don't consume what will happen. So all this has been extensively tested and they're like super safe. Oh, the last question from you, the last person. Uh, Michael uh, Pradeep Kumar. Residues from science is cultivated. Hold it close to your mouth. Residues from science is cultivated to society. Is there necessity of such kind of science? Could you please repeat? Okay. Residues are byproducts from science is culprit to society. Is there necessity of such kind of science? This is Could you please elaborate a little bit what exactly you perceive uh, from the residues of the science? I think it's a completely different context it was taken, but I don't think that's Oh, I see. So, yeah, so that is the problem with everything, right? And the question is, okay, one school of thought is like, when the best sites are so toxic, why don't you ban it? Right? Simple solution. But the question is, can it be done? So, I don't think like we have alternative technologies to replace the best sites as of today. So, then that's the where you have to make a choice whether you want to focus on your agriculture heat, crop heat, where you can protect. Or take care of everything, but like you know, whatever the yield you get, like you know, uh, sufficient with that. So it doesn't go as simple as this, right? You know, it's much bigger conversation people have been having for decades, and uh, I don't think like hundred percent ban is happened. Like you know, there are once in a while they keep banning like a few of them, and you know, you have different forms coming and so on. So then the question comes like, do you, first of all, do you, do you need to invent the sex? Then you have to make the choice as agriculture students, I think we should make that choice. Right? You don't have to go to pharma or like an investment company. What would what would you do? So that's the important choice to okay. And that air conditioner there. Actually, everything in this room is releasing toxic fumes. Right? So it is a residue. Bad or good? The cushion material fabric on which you are sitting is actually releasing fumes, plastic toxic fumes, polyphenols. So is it bad or good? So it's like Praveen said, we have to decide. The residues will always be there. And I am always fond of telling all my students, we set this planet on fire the day we discovered how to make fire. That's it, <laughs> Yes, uh, with this uh, we uh, come to the end of your today's uh, panel discussion for science, for society, of course, the word and also as added in it. But in between, uh, very interesting that questions added with uh, the word religion too. So, science and for religion, society, so all such things have been involved and good that our uh, panelists have done a very good job in this aspect. We need to give a very big round of applause for a yeah, very good panel discussion on those eminent topics related to agriculture. So, I need to end up with two quotes from eminent scientists uh, to end up this uh, science for society panel discussion. You know it very well. So our uh, former president, APG Abdul Kalam said, science is a beautiful gift to humanity. We should not distort it. Of course, science for society lies everywhere. Whether we speak about residues or else whether they are real culprits, it is the knowledge which is mainly taken care of to have our discretionary power in it. So science for today is technology for tomorrow. Another quote from Edward Tiller. So in this regard,
So I thank all uh, the panelists uh, who have come here to join us for the discussion on panel discussion specifically on science for society. I once again thank all of them for being with us and on behalf of the University of Agriculture Sciences and on behalf of the postgraduate uh, directorate of education in the University of Science, Agriculture Sciences. So I profusely thank each one of them and uh, as a token of gesture, so I request them to accept the uh, gift from uh, Dr. Chinnaswamy, Professor of Agriculture and also PPMC head. A big round of applause once again. Once again. Okay, um, as a, a parting shot for this uh, beautiful program, whichever, whichever happened in JKVK, I must tell you, I don't think uh, though these, uh, you know, distinguished people had a kind of a place where there was such an argument on that. And naturally, when you talk about consciousness, all your, you, you know, whatever uh, rights you have and so on and so forth, your brain, your emotions, and naturally people vibe with whatever we are talking. And that was, that's what has happened today. And there are a lot of questions, people disagree and agree here. And I'm sure this is the best uh, kind of program we have to end up telling. We'll disagree to disagree on so many issues. We still go forward as beautiful people on this earth. And thank you so much. You made my day as a director of postgraduate studies. I never thought we have such beautiful students here. And I'm sure you, you carry the memories of very brilliant students from JKVK. And uh, uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, just before, I just want to interject. I have never had such a brilliant bunch of students. Honestly, it's been fun. And, and for today, uh, we have uh, the professor of uh, soil science, a distinguished person, and I'm so happy you, he came and did the job uh, splendidly well as what he was supposed to do. And uh, we want to give him a rest, and uh, we want to uh, go home and uh, have a nice uh, tea uh, from the cup we are giving. This belongs to postgraduate department. Oh, Thank you very much. That, that, that much is only for milk, not for beer. Sorry. Sorry. Professor is telling about tea, you are changing the menu. Yes, sir, sir. Okay. Protein.